My name is DJ Chuang, and I am reading from this new book by Eugene Cho, Thou Shalt Not Be a Jerk, A Christian Guide to Engaging Politics, published by David C. Cook. Introduction. Politics Matter. Authors might feel compelled to invest their time writing a book for many different reasons. Some might be drawn by a particular excitement or passion, and others might feel a sense of burden. Both are important. As a pastor and leader trying to help guide churches, other leaders, and Christians in our current landscape, it's not excitement that motivates me to write this book. In fact, I never envisioned I would be writing a book about the intersection of faith and politics, especially one titled, Thou Shall Not Be a Jerk. What a downer. However, I feel compelled to write this book. In other words, I am burdened for the church and the aspect of discipleship and Christ likeness that often feels in short supply in our culture. I've even started the first chapters of many other books on more safe or spiritual topics, but I kept feeling called back to this book. I didn't major in political science in college, nor am I a political junkie or an expert on all things at the intersection of faith and politics. I've never run for public office or served on anyone's campaign, although I unsuccessfully ran for middle school president. I can still picture the Fort for Cho poster. I have much to learn, and there are many other books you can read, which I'll quote and recommend. So, why write this book? As I shared, I am deeply concerned and, at times, deeply grieved by the state of the political affairs in our society. Even as I write this book, I am processing horrific recent news of pipe bombs mailed to political leaders, shootings at Jewish synagogues, a mass shooting at a mosque in New Zealand, and bombs explos bomb explosions in churches and hotels in Sri Lanka. These terrorists asked. These terrorist attacks are indeed despicable and should be condemned by everyone. But we should not pretend this happened overnight. The unconscionable is possible when, over the years, we've normalized violent rhetoric, mocking, bullying, and the demonization of others. Clearly, we can't blame it merely on the broad umbrella of politics, but it's plain to many that something has significantly shifted in our culture and politics to our detriment. Within the church, it's all too convenient to blame the larger culture and society. I'm equally concerned by the manner in which Christians are engaging the political machine. For example, certain Christians have altogether dismissed and disengaged themselves from the political process, either because it's too exhausting or because of the theological bent that shaped their conclusion that a follower of Jesus should only focus on spiritual things. Simultaneously, I'm concerned by Christians who appear to be overly obsessed by politics, and by this I mean we've chosen to justify everything we do for the sake of our political ideologies, views, or convictions. Additionally, I'm concerned by Christians who are heavily influenced by a vision of cultural Christianity and the power we can wield in our society without necessarily being about the ways and heart of Christ. While many present various challenges to Christianity, including secularism, I would submit that the greatest challenge is actually within Christianity. It's the temptation to build structures and institutionalism of Christianity, but without a parallel commitment to Jesus. It's politicians and even Christian pastors and leaders who sprinkle on a pinch of Jesus into our thinking, speeches, or sermons, but often in a way that fulfills our agenda or goals. In other words, using Jesus to promote nationalism is simply not the way of Jesus. This is the danger of cultural Christianity that eventually and predictably produces cultural Christians rather than disciples of Jesus. And from a political perspective, cultural Christianity is where our theology is held captive by our politics rather than our politics being informed and even transformed by our theology. The danger of this predicament takes us back to the Garden of Eden, 
where Adam and Eve were tempted to be like or even to be God. In other words, the oldest sin in humanity has been to conform God into our image. So as we read the scriptures, if we're never offended, convicted, disrupted, or stirred by the Holy Spirit, it's quite possible that we've conformed Jesus into our thinking, liking, and image. So, what are the dangers and implications of cultural Christianity? Imagine a Christianity that conforms to a culture in all of its shifts and changes and no longer adheres to the scandalous, radical love, grace, teachings, and life of Jesus Christ. Imagine an institutional Christianity that's obsessed with power, influence, and platform without a commitment to the countercultural commitment of Jesus Christ, a commitment to empire rather than the kingdom of God. How else could we explain what transpired in Germany with the rise of Hitler and Nazism? In Germany, at the start of World War II, some historians report that up to 94% of the nation were professing Christians. How could there be such dissonance except to acknowledge the ills and poison of cultural Christianity? How else could we explain why so many would profess to be Christians and yet choose to become seduced by the evil propaganda of Hitler? But it wasn't just merely an anomaly in Nazi Germany. We have witnessed this throughout history when Christian institutions go to bed with power and then embody practices that are antithetical to the gospel. This was evident when religious leaders used erroneous theology to dismiss and judge the poor in the book of Amos. This was evident when missionaries engaged in horrific practices of colonization and abuse of power with Native Americans boarding school. What an incredible stain to the witness of Christ to the world. During the summer of 2019, I was invited by World Relief to lead a small group of American pastors to travel to Rwanda for the purpose of listening and learning about truth-telling, confession, forgiveness, justice, and reconciliation from Rwandan citizens, activists, and pastors. Why Rwanda? Tragically, the people and nation of Rwanda experienced what has often been referred to as the Rwandan Genocide, an unfathomable series of events in 1994 where for about 100 days, approximately 1 million total Rwandans were killed, including more than 800,000 minority Tutsis at the hands of extremist Hutus. The reasons are complex. It involves decades of painful history, dehumanization, dangerous policies and colonization at the hands of Belgium, but what's not complex is that Rwandans killed Rwandans. Families killed family. Neighbors killed neighbors. Even some husbands killed their Tutsi wives. Christians killed fellow Christians. What makes this tragedy even more incredulous is that during the time of the genocide, both ethnic groups were prominently Christian as over 90% of the Rwandan population claimed and still claims to adhere to the Christian faith. As I walk through the halls and exhibits of the Rwandan Genocide Memorial in Kigali, which reported that about 250,000 victims were brought to be buried, I could only ask the question, how could this happen? As hard as it is to believe or don't want to believe, Many places of worship, churches, and parishes of various sizes and denominations were complicit in the evil of the genocide. Places like the Matarama Church, where more than 5,000 people were massacred by Hutu soldiers and militias. Indeed, many places of worship became death traps. During our time there, we had the privilege and burden of hearing from both victims and perpetrators from citizens and government officials, and from Catholic and Protestant leaders and pastors. They gave us a stern warning about the dangers of placing any allegiance above our obedience to Jesus Christ and the kingdom of God. In essence, the dangers of cultural Christianity. They obviously wished that this had never taken place in their 
countries and churches history. And yet they made it clear that they didn't want to be known only by the horrors and evils of the genocide, but that truth-telling, confession, forgiveness, and reconciliation could be possible. Through pain and tragedy, Rwanda had, Rwanda had much to teach the rest of the world. They have much to teach American leaders. They have much to teach American pastors and the church in a country where some often boast of our Christian roots and identity. The lesson again is that there's a distinct and dangerous difference between cultural Christianity and following Jesus Christ. We'll tackle these various tensions and temptations, but the heart of this book is to tend to follow fellow Christians who deeply care about our society, church, culture, and politics, and who want to engage but don't quite know how to navigate this messy and chaotic space. Sound familiar? As a pastor, I've heard this countless of countless times. I care. I want to care. I just don't know how to go about it. You are not alone. I'm wrestling too. It feels jarring. So many of us are wondering how can we be faithful to Christ, remain engaged, and maintain our integrity. In other words, how can we continue to be Christ-like in the chaos and craziness of our political climate? In this endeavor, there are three realities to be mindful as you engage this book. This isn't a comprehensive book that covers global politics. Focuses, it focuses mostly on North American Christians and American politics, and thus while much of the content can be applied to global Christians, it will require some work of contextualization, contextualizing what you read into your respective space. While we care about our larger global contexts, it's not realistic to write a book that covers such an expansive perspective. Two, I love books and I'll utilize many thoughts through I love books and I'll utilize many throughout this book, but several of the resources I cite are digital. In many ways, it speaks to both how information is being distributed and consumed and the pace in which events are occurring in our society. Three, and lastly, if this book is remotely pulled, pulling its weight, it should challenge and at times upset people from various political sides. For someone who wrestling, for someone who wrestles with wanting to be liked by everyone and avoiding conflict, this is absolutely the worst possible book to write. As we now all know, there are two topics that shouldn't be discussed, religion and politics. Oh well. I'm certain that every single person who reads this book will disagree with something, if not many things, and that's okay. While those who are firmly entrenched in their views, camps, and tribes may find little use for this book except to disagree with me, I'm hoping there are many in between who might be both encouraged and challenged to be more faithful and deeply embody their faith in Jesus Christ. It's not my intent to tell people who to vote for or how to vote on any specific issues, although I'll certainly talk about some issues and why it's so critical for us to use prayerful discernment through the lens of scripture and the life of Christ. The aim is not to be prescriptive on what or who to vote for, but rather descriptive in our identity as followers of Christ. Even then, I suspect this book will solicit, as I shared earlier, many criticisms from the left, the right, and everyone in between. I've heard many of them already. You can't play both sides. You're too cowardly. You have no backbone. You're being too political. You're too privileged. Why can't you just focus on Jesus? What kind of pastor are you? To some, you're too conservative. To others, you're too liberal. To be a Christ follower is to be faithful amidst tension. To stay engaged, to remain hopeful, to love anyway, to walk in integrity, and to bear witness to the love, mercy, and grace of Christ. This is becoming increasingly difficult, but such is our call as followers of Jesus. It's not merely what we believe, but also how we engage. As you will read in the chapters ahead, 
I don't believe government in and of itself is a solution for all of society's ills. However, government plays a significant role, and how we engage in the process of governance is of critical importance. My hope is that this book is for all of us, whether we identify as red, purple, red, blue, purple, or any other color of this political spectrum. You may be obsessed with politics hanging on every maneuver, every strategic wrangling, completely bought into the game. You may be defending your favored party's positions steadfastly. You may be hopeful, believing that we finally have leaders who get it. You see that God is at work and our prayers have been answered with the leaders in place. Or you may be dismayed but optimistic, believing politics has value and better days are ahead. I'm encouraged by the participation we see in politics today, not necessarily because of the political decisions themselves, but because so many Americans are rising to the occasion to vote. For example, in the 2018 mid-year election, almost half of all possible voters actually voted. More than 70, more than 47% of people cast ballots in the 2018 midterms, the highest midterm turn, the highest midterm turnout in many in more than 50 years. But many, maybe you didn't make it to the polls during the last election. You are ambivalent about politics, but willing to engage if the right leader with the right ideas ever came along. That's not an uncommon scenario, and we have different reasons for disengaging. If this describes you, I'm sure you have your own unique reasons why. Maybe you've disengaged because you've come to the opinion that politics and government are evil, diabolical. It's simply not the place for Christians to be. You stay out of it to focus on things that are spiritual and holy as if this world as this world is not our ultimate home. Maybe you have become cynical and even exhausted. Perhaps you are more perhaps you more strongly believed in the political process at some point, but no longer. You may see occasional value in political action and advocacy, but time and again you have seen that our political process is broken beyond repair. So you've decided instead to choose other battles in life and leave political fights for someone else. I understand. I sometimes feel burned out, disillusioned, even deeply discouraged at times because of politics. But I want to encourage you, believer, take heart. There is a different way. Hear this well. Politics matter. They matter because politics inform policies that ultimately impact people. When I read the Bible, it's emphatically clear that people matter to God, including and especially people who are marginalized, oppressed, forgotten, and on the fringe of our larger society. While some Christians have chosen to disengage from the political process, remain silent, or retreat to the sidelines, that kind of isolation or retreat from society is not endorsed by this book. I believe Christians ought to engage our larger culture, including the many facets and nuances of what we label politics. On the other hand, we're living in a cultural context in which it appears and certainly feels as if politics has consumed our lives. Politics not only filled the airwaves of our 24-7 cable news culture, but can inundate our daily lives in conversations, marketplaces, dinner meals, and yes, even within our churches. Now, this isn't necessarily a bad thing, but it can become toxic if not rooted, if not rooted in a strong biblical and theological foundation. Why? Because of the idolatry of politics is eating away at the civic discourse of our nation. But it's not just in our nation, it's happening within the Christian community as well. Since politics is a necessary process of any healthy society, this book is exactly that. A practical resource to help Christians navigate the chaotic and turbulent winds of political engagement, not as an end to itself, but as an expression of our discipleship as followers of Jesus Christ. In the chapters ahead, I urge believers not to go to bed with political parties, 
and their powerful politicians. In doing so, we lose the prophetic ability to speak truth to power. As I've shared already, I will continue to repeat, I'm not suggesting that Christians stand on the sidelines, but we shouldn't ever profess blind loyalty to a party. And by party, I mean any party. This is much of what's happening today. Cultural Christianity has bowed to political loyalties. It's neither radical nor countercultural in the way of Jesus. Rather, it's a bastardized and infected form of cultural Christianity. Another word for what I just described is idolatry. Consider the sharp rebuke from Thomas Merton for both progressives and conservatives alike. I see little real substance in the noisy agitations of progressives who claim to be renewing the church and who are either riding some rather silly bandwagon or caught up in factional rivalries. As for, as for conservatives, they are utterly depressing in their tenacious clinging to meaningless symbols of dead power, their Baroque inertia, their legalism, disgust. Remember, as believers of Jesus Christ, we are to seek first the kingdom of God, Matthew 6.33, and not the kingdom of our party or respective country. And since this statement likely will elicit a strong pushback and feelings, please note there's a big difference between patriotism and nationalism. Go ahead, be patriotic. I am. I'm an immigrant and a child of parents who were born in what is now called North Korea. When they were children, they were, there was only one Korea before the devastating Korean War separated and divided both, the na both a nation and millions of families. We immigrated in 1977 when I was six years old. I am one of the million of immigrants who made their way to the United States. And while my story might be unique, I'm a proud, naturalized American citizen who would be quick to share with others the important distinction between patriotism and nationalism. Nationalism points to a potentially dangerous view of exceptionalism. For example, and for those who identify as Americans, the idea of American exceptionalism can be a dangerous guise for American supremacism. In other words, it functions purely through the lens of a worldly power and will do anything to obtain and preserve that power. Now imagine the countercultural stories of Jesus Christ, who must be the central figure in our theology, worship, and life. For example, we must remember the story of Jesus washing the feet of his disciples especially in a cultural context in which teachers of the law instructed Jewish people not to wash the feet of others because it was considered too menial and dirty. Jesus washing feet is truly radical. This is mind-blowing and heart-transforming. We are inundated by politics, party, and power in these confusing times, but this is precisely why we must be about the kingdom of God. If you feel hazy about what the kingdom of God looks like, look to Jesus. He's not a domesticated puppet of our worldly power structures. The crucified and risen Christ is Lord and Savior. Indeed, we must keep looking to Jesus. Better yet, we must make sure we don't just admire him from afar, but actually worship and follow Jesus, his words, his teachings, and his ways.